call it full of color We'll leave the truth uncovered Cause all these lies are white We use the words we write To shine a light on life My light is lava like It's hot and burning Hey everybody, we are back with Anne Seen I'm Cynthia Dorsey I'm Veronique Lachelle McRae And we're so happy you're here today We're going to jump right into our newest play I'm super excited about it uh, Veronique, tell us about the author. Okay, so the author is Kirsten Greenwich. She's actually a playwright that hails from Boston, Massachusetts. And when researching her, she actually uh, grew up writing plays first about her neighbors and the kids that she was around. And eventually she and her sister started taking theater classes at a family theater, I believe it was called Wheelock. And eventually that led to her going to study um, Playwriting, she um, attended Wesleyan University, studied with Derek Cloud, and that's where she won her first playwriting award. Um, She went on to the University of Iowa to continue to study, and she really focused on developing her voice as a playwright with focuses on race, class, and gender. And that's where her stories kind of formed in the American theater. That led her... um, to become a recipient of the Village Voice Obie Award for her play that we are discussing today, Milk Like Sugar. Um, and it was commissioned by La Jolla Playhouse and Theater Masters. She's currently an assistant professor at Boston University um, and continuing on with her works are still getting independent reviewers, um, but not Buddy, Zenith. So she has a plethora of works focused on that, but I'm really excited about how she developed her voice and what her voice says in this piece. So if you have not heard about her before, I think especially after this show, you should definitely look her up, learn more about her and her other pieces and especially Milk Like Sugar. Yes, yes. Oh, and that just gave me chills. I'm so intrigued by this playwright. I want to learn more. Um, I'm going to give you guys a brief synopsis on what Milk Like Sugar is about. So it starts with Annie Desmond. Annie Desmond is the main character. It's her sweet 16th birthday. And her and her friends decide they're going to celebrate by going to get tattoos. Yes, tattoos. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But before the night is over, you hear their conversation and they're into the same things. They want the hottest new phones. They like the cute boys, designer bags, typical 16-year-old stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And they decide to go into a pregnancy pact. This pact Mm -hmm. would make all of them supposedly pregnant at the same time to commemorate their friendship and they would raise their babies together. Yes. Mm. 16 year old conversations. (laughs) Well, Annie, you know, she's kind of hesitant about this pack, but she doesn't really tell her friends up front. Um, But she's forced to look at the world through a different lens. She befriends a young boy named Malik, who has promise and future and, you know, speaks all of the, you know, the things that are outside of their neighborhood and going to college. And that really intrigues Annie. She also makes friends with a young girl named Kiera, who is more of like an evangelist. Um, she's talking all of the scriptures and everything, and that gives Annie, um, an insight into religion. So she's very inspired by things outside of that pack with her friendship, outside of the typical norms of her community. But Mm -hmm. at the end, we see her make a decision that is irreversible and hence probably leads her down um another path not the same path that it her inspirations came from right this play is witty it's funny full of lots of language and poetry and most importantly hope so um yeah. Nick, what did you think about it what did you think about the play uh, the play is so packed 
like it's a lot to unpack with the piece and the way that the playwright was able to do that in what 60 something pages and address what she did but the first thing I saw as soon as I started reading this piece is how many Annie's Talisha's Malik's have I met in my work with youth particularly in the inner city or urban areas like how many of these how how the playwright really captured real life mm -hmm. to me and it, it, it honestly it made me a little sad because you see on this 16th birthday and celebration they're making this pact because to me it shows how these young women wanted someone to love and how so many young especially teenagers will have children just saying well i will love them because i'm not receiving that love or i can give them all the love i never have or they'll be here to love me mm -hmm. not understanding the weight and responsibility that comes with that that love that comes with a child and um the way that it just wove in and out and started looking at you know relationships, packs, loyalties. Like you could see a Talisha and how she was the strong one of the group and influencing and seeing Annie wrestle, like it just lets you know that just with the slight bit of exposure to something else that, you know, you can see beyond your circumstances. Unfortunately, it may not have been enough exposure or strong enough for Annie in her final decision making or her final outcome that we see in the play but just looking at those dynamics that are very real today they've been real for so long and then generationally seeing how they're passed down through these yeah. characters like it's not new like the stories of the parents behind these characters and the you know their fellow classmates um yeah, it was just for me, just that that punch right in the beginning when you realize what these young ladies are talking about mm -hmm. at the 16th birthday party. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, yeah, I I have to agree with you wholeheartedly. It's like these three young ladies are in their world, in their bubble, and not fully aware of the world outside of their bubble. Their world is great, right? They get to go to class hang out skip maybe go to gym class maybe not go to gym class bully somebody to do their work like these typical teenage mm -hmm. nuances that we see in everyday life it's 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 great i cherish those memories i had from high school i cherish my 16th year of life wholeheartedly but like you said once she began to get inspired by other thoughts and other possibilities then her mind began to grow and wonder and dream and hope you know and it's absolutely right you're absolutely right like our kids it although we need to celebrate them in our in their bubbles we need to like which is what I appreciate about this play, like even the vernacular and mm -hmm. how the girls communicate. And like, um, I'm, t I'm assuming this is probably like the 90s because there's like slide phones and coach bags and all of the stuff that was popular during that time is in this play. So that is celebrating their world, right? But also, I hope, my hope for children is that we celebrate them in their bubble, but we also introduce them to things outside of their bubble so that they can then attach things to who they are, attach things to their history, and attach things to their community. So if when she began to simply learn about a telescope, you know, and looking at the stars, and that you didn't have to meet up with a boy and have sex with him. You could legit just be his friend. That brought some very priceless knowledge to her. And mm -hmm. I think we have to think when you read this, like you have to think of the children of the world. If you don't, it, it, it's not as impactful, right? You have to place your Annie in there that you know. You have to place your Talisha that you know into the story because it will help us as adults um, lean into them and love on them and celebrate them and bring in some new thought 
for them outside of their bubble. Right. Even with that exposure, like you were saying, outside of the bubble, it was interesting to see the development of Kira and her relationship mm. that began with Annie and how at first it seems like she has this idealistic family, one that is foreign to the thought process of a Talisha or Annie. And she's the one who's Talisha's like, get my paper done or else. You know, we see her very almost like virginal like, like you know, the long skirts, this, that, and the other, because she's trying to, she has her own religious path um, mm -hmm. that she's on. And she talks about, you know, well, does your family sit with you? And do you have a balanced meal? And do you do these things, these things that are formed? Because we see Annie's mom works all the time and the birthday was pretty much dismissed. And, you know, Annie's mother is a, a custodian, a janitor at an office yeah. with dreams of writing, but can't read, you know, so we, we see that Annie is kind of caught in this one circumstance and Kira brings her another idea just for us to learn that Kira's reality is not her ideal, but she's striving for something more. Somehow she's been exposed for her through church that there's something else I can live beside this narrative. And what I found interesting is that when Annie started speaking to, hey, there could be something more for us beside this narrative, what conflict it started to create mm. her circle of friends because what i've noticed in real life whether teenagers like they are or adults when we start sometimes striving for something different or more it causes conflict and yes. then your friendship is put you know in jeopardy because they're like do you think you're better than or what's wrong with this there's nothing wrong with me you're acting oh you think you're better than us you know and we see how the friendship starts to develop fractures because annie is like but there could be something more but what about those stars what about those people looking down in the plane what 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 why can't I, why should it be Jordan's? Maybe I am supposed to wear satin slippers, Yeah, you know? And as you see her wrestling with this, you're like, like you said, you're glad that they, they need their world, you know, acknowledged and not dismissed, but also exposed to other things. But how many of us are more comfortable with the devil we know than the thing we don't? Mm. Say that again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like how many of us really are comfortable with the devil we know versus the thing we don't because there might be something more but talisha and margie this is what they know and ain't nothing else this is what we're going to do we're friends this is a pack don't talk about that that's not real it hurt because in a sense they had already settled they their innocence for hopefulness seem to be gone because this was the only way that we were going to have and we only have each other where Annie throughout the play has some sense of hopefulness and uh, starts to begin with her relationship um, with Malik and Kira to see that there could be something more even though though but the ones who were closest to her who could probably push her forward to that something more didn't believe that you know the mother in the conversations with the mother and the mother tearing her down and Talisha saying that you're not loyal and Margie, you know, like don't back out. So it's interesting because we can be those influences and try to expose more, but it also, when your core people are against it, it's harder for you to break out sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I think it starts at a young age defining what friendship is. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to definitely do that more in our children so that when you become an adult, you have an understanding of what you desire as a friendship and you can communicate that with other people. I think at 16, you don't necessarily have those tools. And so she wasn't able to communicate and be firm on the fact like, I don't necessarily agree with this pact, right? Even when she was choosing a tattoo, like, I want a ladybug, and though you're making fun of it, I like ladybugs, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's very hard for kids to um, not necessarily uh, go with every the crowd, like follow the crowd and mm -hmm. be an individual, you know what I mean? And so I just, I really 
appreciated that in the writing, that struggle with friendship, that struggle mm-hmm. defining who you are and what you want and what you want to do and not following that of your friends. And I think in adulthood, um, some of us still are struggling with that, right? Like your friend wants you to do this and you're like, okay, I'll go and do it with you. (laughs) Not necessarily really wanting to. I think being assertive in that will then garner real friendship, right? I don't want to do this, Veronique. I don't want to do this. And mm-hmm. you accept that as my friend, and we are still friends. You know what I mean? Right. Okay. And but and then that comes in, like you said, knowing the definition of friendship. Because for her to go against them, it it posed the risk of losing them. Yeah. And we know what happens anyway. Yeah. And everybody's right. definition of friendship is different. I've learned that. Um, right. it's something we learn in life, everybody. And, and I think in order to be friends with another person, you have to communicate what your definition is. So if my right. definition is you call me on the phone every day and you're like, no, that's not my definition. Then we either come to a common ground or we, we're not meant to be friends. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. yeah. And I just think like, um, we have to teach our girls that. You know, we have to teach our girls that. We have to teach our boys that. Um, Exactly defining what you think friendship is. And you're learning. It grows. It changes. It shifts. Like, what I needed when I was 16 from a friend is not what I need now. You know? So just recognizing that that will change, and that's okay. And it it also looked at the relationships, even when I was looking at that, how, you know, we're looking at the young women, the teenagers, and what they're going through, and then their relation and what pressures or positions, too, that that put the young men in. Now, even though we don't see them as often, they're not the main character, the Antoine and Malik, you know, it was like a selection. Oh, right. you're going to sleep with Malik and get this done. Right. And that's not what Malik wanted, right? Right. Because he had his eyes expanding his view and how Talisha was like, no, you just, you know, you just need to sleep with them. And I think in having the opportunity to discuss and with our young women and our young men about what choices we make and how not to put others in a position. Mm -hmm. Like it's very delicate because no matter what they were like, we're going to do, you know, we want this pregnancy pack. Oh, just sleep with them. Yeah. But not realizing the ramifications. Oh, we can do it by ourselves. We don't need him. Yeah, because they got programs. And they got whip, and they got this. Oh, and the baby's gonna be cute because we already got camouflage and my mommy's knitting a sweater. Right. You know. And, and babies. And the quote was, "Babies ain't a lot of work. Like they're right. making a baby dolls. <laughs> like, <What>? yeah." <laughs> and 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 it's harsh because when you're looking for love, right? I'm like, even with Annie in her struggle and then her ultimate decision, because it was the first time somebody paid this much attention to her and told her she was beautiful. And yeah. And she, you know, she sleeps with him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and that's your, you know, life altering decision. Your first yeah. time and you sleep with him. And oh, we don't need to know about the bananas and protection, but you do. Oh, cause bananas yeah. don't talk. So. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they're not going to tell you it doesn't, you know, such and such. And then we see this cycle because also building up, having that, I think for our young ladies, knowing their self-worth. And I appreciated a character like Malik Mm -hmm. because he was like, I've got my eyes on a certain goal and I'm not trashing you for it. I want you to see what I see. We don't have to be like this. And of course, they still had their tiffs. You know, they had their argument. He was like, whatever. I thought you were different. And she's like, you're not better than me stuff. Um, Because they're teenagers and people and real. But I appreciated um, seeing the two of them interact, like you said earlier, to know that we can be in relationship and it not be sexual. And we can talk and strive and think and ask questions and it's okay. I think we're also taught or built in certain environments that this is your environment, this is what it is. Like I have extended fam who live on Minnesota Avenue in Southeast DC. And some of them, you know, when they talk about neighbors or anything, they're just like, 
this is what it is and nothing changes. But some of them are like, no, I'm going to go try to take these classes or I'm going to do this. You know, my fam is there because they want to see change. And then there might be neighbors who are like, no, this is what it is. Yeah. Right? Because you're in that environment and you're not exposed to anything else and you're usually written off. So even that, you know, even when I'm looking at the educational system and things and they're the teacher who was stapling the college pamphlet and Annie took a peek. Right. And Malik was glad that Annie took a peek, you know. Yeah. Um, just, just those little moments, those little things. Yeah. So you guys might be wondering, why is this play called Milk Like Sugar? Well, at the end of the play, um, Annie has a little short monologue, and I'll read to you a little bit of it. She said, we supposed to be drinking real milk. Instead, we fed that powdered kind that looks like sugar. School feeds us sugar. The street of this place feed us sugar and we like it we lap it up we at the ready for it like it vitamin d added 100 percent pure goodness meant to feed us instead of rot our insides out milk like sugar on all our shelves in this place and we happy for it shit stupid mm -hmm. And so, what do you think of that final monologue that gives us some insight on why the play is called Milk Like Sugar? To me, and it might be because my culinary background pops up in the back of my head too, that shit is stupid. Yeah. It's not really good for you. It's something to placate you, to satiate you, to make you think you're getting the real thing or the essence of something, but it's not. Yeah. And then even when she's like, you know, that kind of sugar, school feeds us sugar, do such and such. If you think, like, if I take it to the left field a little bit for a minute, sugar does the body no good, right? Sugar, not fat, that's the problem in dietary things. It's sugar, mm -hmm. right? And the more sugar you have, the more sugar, it, it causes problems. It acts like the body responds to it as if it's dopamine or crack, you know, or mm -hmm. some type of drug because it triggers that response. So you want more of it, but it's not good for you. And it's like this environment, this school is feeding me this, the government gives me, this, and I'm happy for it, right? Because mm -hmm. at least I got some kind of milk or, oh, they gave me something. I didn't have to get it. Oh, and I'm feeding this and I'm taking it in. And when she's like, meant to feed us instead of rot our insides out but it does rot your insides out right we're thinking it's something that feeds us and it's nutritional but it rots us out and I felt like that was very poignant and I felt so bad I was just like when I was reading I was like damn because I was like she got the revelation yes but a little bit too late uh, too late Reverend. and you know yeah. what don't and that's the thing we can't write her off either you know what I'm saying right. You can get the revelation and, you know, just to give you guys some insight, she did end up getting pregnant. Um, but just because she is a teenage mother doesn't mean she's written off, right? right. So this revelation can really propel her to a new, a new level, right? She can still go to college. She can still go. There. It's just that her pathway will be different. Um, and yeah. And it's... um. And I love you saying that too, because I've worked with so many young ladies who were pregnant as teenagers and felt like that was the end. And I'm like, as long as you have breath in your body, you know, that's not the end. And, and your child is not a burden. It just means your path is going to probably look different. And there's nothing wrong with it because it's your path. Right. But that it's not like, it's not that all hope is lost. Right. Um, and you can also, knowing what you've gone through, have that choice. Will she respond to her child the same way that her mother responded to her? Or will she now be in the position to kind of break those generational chains and, to me, curses yeah. that have carried through? Because the way, and the reason I use the term curse, because, you know, like, mom really not, they're not an encouraging like relationship from what we can see because the mom is trying to work and put it together so she doesn't have time for her because it's like well I got to provide for you 
right? right? A lot of children are still like, but I need something emotionally. Right. And because of the circumstances where you have to work so much, the emotion, you know, part, that part of building a relationship gets lost. So Annie is in a position to say, you know, what will I, you know, what can I do now? Now that I'm realizing that, that this isn't for me, that means it's not for me or the child that's coming. Right. And, you know, what can... And I do now. And it was also very interesting because in the end she makes this pact, but where are those friends? They're gone. Very important. Very important. Kira <laughs> has moved. Unfortunately, Talisha's in the abusive relationship gone there. Um, bless her heart. I forgot her name off the top of my head. To start Kira. with M. Like they're all gone. Maggie? Yeah. 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 All, you know, gone. So we made this pact, this childhood pact. You know, we made this pact as friends, and I'm here. Y'all aren't, and now I got this belly, and now I have to make these new decisions. But I did appreciate Malik still being around. Yes. Yeah. I just felt that was really, because, again, it shows that they're still here, this friendship there, that even with the arguments and things that, there are people who still believe in you. You're not written off. Right. You know? And so I did appreciate that moment in her with the telescope and him still telling her, no, you keep it. You look through it because right. he's reminding her that there's always hope that there's always more and that you will be okay as long as you believe that. And I appreciated that moment too. Yes. Well, guys, I hope you read this play. Please, I'm definitely going to look up some more of Kirsten's plays because I am a fan of her writing. Thank you, Kirsten, for this body of work. Um, as a director, me and Veronique were talking, director and actor, I'm like, oh, this would be great to direct. Um, yeah, so our special guest is coming on, and we cannot wait for you guys to meet her. All right, everybody, we are here with Ramona Tim Key. Hi, Ramona. Hi. <laughs> How are you? How's quarantine treating you? Um, quarantine has actually been really, really good to me. Um, I have found a lot more joy. Um, I have tapped into more hobbies and more things that I love. And I honestly, I'm starting to dread the idea of people taking my time you know, and me not be able to continue putting myself first. Mm. So I think once quarantine is over, I have to learn more about my boundaries and balance. Yeah. But yeah, I'm actually really enjoying it. I feel as though I have grown so much and healed so much and just felt, found so much like self-love and as I said, joy and peace. Oh, yeah. So How about you? That's so good to same. I needed the time to rest. Um, I needed the time to do all of the creative stuff that I wanted to do that I didn't have time to do because mm -hmm. I was at work all day. Um, right. I'm really appreciating this time and I don't necessarily want it to end. And I know at some point it's going <laughs> to have to, but yeah. I, I, I'm like you, like I'm, I'm really appreciative of how much I've grown um, mm -hmm. spiritually, intellectually, Ooh, yes. and as a creative. And yeah. I'm, like, I'm, I'm not taking this time for granted at all. So. Same, same at all. Yeah. How about yeah, you? Like I'm going to come out like a new person. Yeah. 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 I think I, I think I struggled with it for a little bit just because I had been like praying and wrestling about certain decisions and I was very on the fence about starting a full-time position and how that would still work with me doing my creative work. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'm going to just start the position and it shut down three weeks later. Oh, um, God. I wrestled with it at first. I think I'm now starting to find a sense of peace with it because I think it gave me an answer that I was actually wrestling with. Um, yeah. So I really enjoyed the three weeks that I don't really think that was where I was supposed to ultimately be for a long time and I can yeah. get committed to places. So I think God was like, let's pull back and reevaluate. So I'm starting to uh I'm starting to find that balance now more of a sense mm -hmm. of I'm probably not as far in. Um but I am kind of dreading the idea of things opening back up. My state that I'm in right now is opening up despite the cases going 
up, but my county, the local ordinance, my county is still shut down. So I appreciate that. And I'm Wait, going, where are you? Um, I'm right now I'm in North Carolina. Oh, okay, okay, okay. They are opening up restaurants and salons and bars and everything. Oh, okay. Except for my county. My county, my mayor's like, no. Yeah. <laughs> because the cases, the numbers are still rising and they've mm-hmm. risen. They've done phase one and they're opening phase two. So my mayor's like, nope, Durham is shut down. I appreciate that. I'm going to continue yeah. to shut down. So <laughs> That's crazy. So I, quarantine, what are some of the hobbies that you, or the things where you were talking about, like spirituality and self-love and self-discovery? What's one thing that maybe you have discovered or rediscovered about yourself at this time? Oh, one thing. Um, I have discovered my power. Uh, I've discovered how to set boundaries and speak up for myself and stand up for my greatest good. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's funny because I feel like a lot of people who see me and who know me, they, they see me as someone who's bold, but a lot of times I tend to think about other people's feelings at the sake of mine. Like I put them over myself, no matter who they are. I just don't want to hurt their feelings. And so sometimes I sell myself short. So I've been doing a lot of work on um, just building myself up, thinking of my future self, what my future self would have accomplished and thinking from that mindset as opposed to this one. Like what boundaries would she set? What would she accept? Um, And it's really helped me like find my voice and speak up and stand firm in what I believe and what I think to be true when it comes to what's best for me. Mm, that's so my good that's so beautiful because <laughs> like even when looking at the plays with women of color that we're looking at and us as artists and creatives and seeking God and how we use those talents and things, our voice can be covered up so much. So just that mm-hmm. discovering that power and that, you know, firmness in who you are like I think that was really powerful about saying what would my future self mm-hmm. say that's really powerful to me yeah for I- our audience watching Ramona is a powerhouse actress um, <laughs> I had the privilege of directing her in one of my short films and um just watching her on set and her process and how she executes and follows directions is impeccable um she's also from trinidad and tobago right yeah and i wanted to <laughs> ask you about that i want to what do you think um if you had to give like what the status is or your insight on caribbean american actors um, what, what do you think, um, the influence is in the industry? If there is any, um, do you think there's a need? Is it something you want to see when it pertains to your culture? So when Americans think of the Caribbean, they just think of Jamaica. Mm. And, um, I honestly don't know that film and TV has, dabbled into the Caribbean diaspora beyond Latin or yeah, like Puerto Rico or DR. Um, I feel as though there is more Latin influence than there is um, any other Caribbean country. And, uh, um, And if we do exist, it's the role of a nanny or a maid or a nurse there are no real powerhouses or leads, male and female, who are, you know, successful in the industry or stories being told. Um, I actually know someone who is doing pretty well, but their accent had to change. Mm. And that, that has actually been a huge struggle for me. Um, I was so set on staying true to myself and I still am. But I have been more open in the last year to taking accent reduction classes so that I can play more. Um, But I think it is so important to me to stay true to my identity because there are so many amazing African-American actors out there and actresses. Like 
you don't need any more. Like, can we add some Caribbean flavor? You know, <laughs> I actually have a concept for a show, but I just haven't done anything with it. But I would love to see, you know, our cute little accent on the screen, you know. And the thing is, what makes it difficult, I think, is that I'm from Trinidad. I was born here, yes, but I was raised in Trinidad. I've never been a maid. I've never been a nanny. I've never been a bartender. Like, I went to college. You know, I have been working since I was 16, yes, but... You know, there's so much more to us than being the caretaker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can be bosses too. Trust me, I'm a boss, okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing is, the Caribbean people were so, so smart because our education system is actually, in my opinion, more difficult. Like, depending on the classes you take, mm -hmm. you get credits off of your first year of university when you come to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know why we're downplayed as the help so much. But I really think our time is coming. Yeah. It isn't here yet, but it, it has to come. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. Especially you, Sam, because you, I, I will say, um, your dedication to character work is remarkable. And so mm -hmm. a lot of directors want that. They want um, someone on set to take the script and make it their own but also it's directable and mm -hmm. um yeah so i know your time is coming with that thank you oh god i have like goosebumps i claim that when i saw that y'all are interviewing like powerhouses <laughs> that like i was like wait <laughs> what are you talking about and i was like you know what i claim it i receive it thank you jesus <laughs> so our thank you. Just, yeah remembering you on set and just your professionalism and the questions you ask and the way you were on it and the way you were in place, like to me, that's just such an honor to work with people with that passion and that professionalism and like you being able to be a voice to, to mm -hmm. raise up and you will be one of those actors who take that screen and take over and show real stories, authentic stories and not being stereotyped. I think you know, like America likes to still define things and keep them mm -hmm. in their boxes. And you're just going to be one of those people who bust the box open to see that, no, there is so much more. Yeah. Less than the, the few writers that try to put a narrative out there, which is, mm -hmm. you know, why I'm thankful we're looking and seeing more women of color stories and focusing on that. Um, yeah. In this interview, and then when you finally decide to jump in, or God gives that nudge, like, okay, write it, then we'll be able to read yours too. You know? Yeah. So exciting to me. Yeah. Thank you. So, you oh. on your resume, um, you uh -huh. have, you've done commercial, you've done film, you've done theater. Um, there's a section that says new media. Can you explain to our viewers what new media is and what you did with it? Uh, so new media is more like web series. Mm -hmm. um, I guess new ways of like, new media, like, you know, you're so accustomed to TV and film, but now there are so many streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. um, so I do have a couple shows, like I, I'm in this show called New York Minutes. Um, I don't really promote it as much, but it has done really well on YouTube. Like, tens of thousands of viewers. I haven't checked recently to see what the viewers is like, but it was so weird. Like I was in Atlanta and someone came up to me and he said, you're in New York minutes. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I am. And I couldn't believe it. Like I w I'm not even a main character. I'm like the girlfriend of a main character. And in the first season, I think I was in like three, maybe three episodes. But I was just like mind blown. I was there for a weekend for an event. Had no idea somebody would like recognize me or remember me. But um, yeah. So that's what new media is. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I want to know what's going on with our film. Wait, okay. Um, so I um, am going to... Okay. <laughs> So I, it, it, 
it is one last film festival that I'm waiting to hear from mm-hmm. um, in Miami. Uh, I think it's Urban Film Festival. They actually asked me to submit it, so hopefully mm-hmm. it, it goes through. Um, and then after that, I was thinking of two, twofold, either submitting it to um, Amazon or... Um, there's a streaming path platform. I forget the name run by a black woman. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget the name of it, but I've talked with her, um, submitted it there or just putting it on YouTube. So those gotcha. are like my two options. Um, it did really well. I got lots of positive feedback on it. Of course, me, myself, I'm super hard on it. Like I can mm-hmm. tell you a million things I wish would have been different, but I feel like this body of work is about to be used in people's classrooms because a lot yeah. of teachers and um, school administrators have co- actually emailed me about using it to talk to their girls. Yeah. Oh, but you, oh, I have crazy goosebumps again. Yeah. Which I think it's, it's, it's important, right? Yeah. That's the audience, yeah. and that's the kind of impact that you want to make. Like, yes, um, people who enjoy film can enjoy it but there's real substance and there's a real message behind it Mm -hmm. and the more that we can um make the younger generation aware of the situations they can run into and a lot of times you're so naive and you're so trusting yeah Mm -hmm. so thank you for thank you for creating this film Thank you. Voice. Thank you for coming all the way from New York. <laughs> to be, to I, I was so happy that you committed to that and your your performance was great. Like that your performance um was one is the one that people talk about. Like they're like, <laughs> what? Like <laughs> so um yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I did want to ask you one more question. Mm -hmm. When you do a cold read, what do you do to prepare for a cold reading? Nothing. Nothing. You just go for it. Yeah. And that's how I approach acting in general. Um, I read the script. I get familiar with the lines. And then I breathe life into it as honest as I possibly can. There is no me walking like the character and talking like the character like i just i'm just an honest actor mm-hmm. and so even with this i didn't read it because it's a cold read yeah so we will see how it goes i have no idea what it's about but i can read all right <laughs> i can read <laughs> all right so we are going to read guys a scene from milk like sugar we've already covered it by kirsten greenwich um um we're going to I, I will read for Annie Renick's going to read for Marjorie and Ramona will read for Talisha ready yeah this kid better come give me my tattoo ASAP or I'm about to jet yo you seen that slider phone slider phones is kaput anybody can get them and Ladybug is like what a little girl there's a song about them Remember that song kids sing about the ladybugs? I like that slider phone. Mm. If this tattoo could is so good, how come he letting me get this shit for free? If he's so good, he should want to get paid, right? Ladybug, ladybug rings and rosy. Ladybug, ladybug rings around the posy. <laughs> you high, all right. No more for you. That's it. That's it, right? That nursery's rhyme? There ain't no such thing as nursery's rhyme. Oh, newsflash. School let out hours ago. This ain't in English class. Well, shut up about nursery's rhymes and give me water, yo. Which reminds me, I gotta find out who's gonna write my papers this year. Yeah, last term, your report card looked like the side of a milk carton. D, D, D. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that fool ain't even typed that damn shit. Where is this kid? Sing that song with me. Miss Jones down the hall watched me, and I didn't go to no nurseries school. Come on, ladybug, ladybug. Your house is on fire. Your children will burn. Your children will burn? 
What kind of shit is that for kids to sing? Kids aren't supposed to sing it. Well, adults show us how don't go around singing it. What adult goes around singing shit? I think it was made up, like, in old times. Like, when women was first going to work and stuff. To make them feel bad just for leaving the house and crap. What you mean women couldn't leave the house and crap? Cause women could leave the house. What person just stays inside the house? Like they're in a zoo or something. Like to work? They made that shit up to scare people. When my mom went to work, Miss Jones kept us all day. Breakfast, lunch, sometimes dinner. What a song about an insect got to do with scaring people? That spider song with the curdles and we're sure used to scare the hell out of me. I only asked to know the words. Shit. Even though a flip phone's all Jerome got, we still do it. Because one day, he gonna have a better one, right? <laughs> one day, maybe, he have a touch screen. Mm. That's what I think about the future. When he mm. got a touch screen. Those, those are the kind of things pop into your head when you pass one of them tests, you all, the future. How many times you had to do it to pass? Me and Jerome, we do it all the time. No, how many times you got to do those tests? Supposed to be the morning day. That's the best kind to make it come out, right? I think me and Jerome must be real what you call, like, fertile, right? We like the way they is in the wild. The wild, Marjorie? Because I only got to take that test one time, and bam, that coach diaper bag almost mine, y'all. And scene. Yay! <laughs> How do you feel about it, Ramona? <laughs> Good. I, I was a little confused. I wasn't sure like what the age group was, and then I realized what we were talking about, and I was like, "Oh, we're grown." <laughs> <laughs> so, just a little background. These girls are sixteen. Oh, okay. Who on popping? I'm talking about uh -huh. <laughs> priorities. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate yeah. you. We wish you nothing but the best. We know the best is yet to come for this for your career and we appreciate your journey thus far and being a part of it and knowing you and i i love you ramona and thank you for coming on our show yes. thank you so much for having me i feel very blessed and i'm so so grateful that you thought that i was worthy and a powerhouse <laughs> you know and i could be a part of this show i really i'm so grateful all paths crossed i believe that everything happens for reason and for our greatest good. And I don't think it was just by chance. And so thank you once again. I mean, your film was the first film that I filmed outside of New York City. It was like I was hired out of state to act in something. It was a huge deal for me. And um, it didn't disappoint. Aww. So thank you, thank you, thank you again. I'm really, really grateful. You are so welcome. And I love you all too. <laughs> nice.